session. My name is Jonathan Marvis Clark, and I'm going to be your host. Um, today is our second AME session and the very first AME session on Twitter space. Um, I want to welcome everyone to today's AME session on Open Fabric Innovative AI Approach. We are thrilled to have you here with us to explore the exciting uh, intersections and, uh, of artificial intelligence at Open Fabric. So with no further ado, I will take this time just to allow our, our speakers to introduce themselves, starting with uh, Hajama, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, all right. Hey, uh, my name is Yalma. I, uh, I work uh, as a, a professor in um, AI and NLP. Well, that is AI, right? Uh, I done this a few years. Before that, I was doing um, neuroscience. I was, uh, did a PhD in neuroscience in the United States, in Princeton. Worked uh, doing neuroscience in, in Brazil and in, in Canada, now in Toronto. And uh, I transitioned over to work uh, on uh, blockchain and AI uh, a few years ago, which is what I'm currently doing, yeah. I think that's it. Awesome. Uh, I guess, Jonathan, we, we lost it for a few seconds. Don't hear anymore. Yeah. You're maybe on mute or something. No, cannot hear you. Sorry. No sound. So yeah, maybe in the meantime, I'll just reduce, introduce myself and see how we can fix that. So uh, as you may already know me, I'm Andre. I'm the CEO of Open Fabric, and uh, uh, no, cannot hear anymore. Let's see. Th those technical troubling, they every time appear. No. Say something. No. Yeah, I guess that's the way to do it. Um, yeah. Reboot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in, in the meantime, maybe we just start a small discussion about, you know. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, m maybe more about like the high level overview about AI uh, space, because, you know, everyone, it, it, you know, AI is a bit hyped, but I guess you are the most, uh, you, you got a lot of experience in the field. So maybe you can share with us like a few ideas about, you know, the overall view of, on, on, on AI space, because uh, it is not what we see today. It's something happening from a long time. Oh, the history of it. No. I, th I think like when it comes to the future, it is very difficult. I have worked at this uh, and I have actually, even though I, I come from neuroscience, what I did in neuroscience, I studied uh, systems, neuroscience and computational neuroscience, which is, you can see it as like, well, well it, you cannot see it like that. It is like that. It is the, the study of natural intelligence, right? And of course, in computational neuroscience, you often use, or well, I'm mean, not often, you always use computational models of the brain. Uh, so essentially, that is also AI, but the goal is more of understanding how it works than to just uh, than just the engineering challenge of making it solve a problem. 
right? Like it's, it's about understanding is the goal more than, than, you know, just lowering the accuracy or uh, maximizing the accuracy, right? Uh, but so I come from this background. Uh, so I have seen this field a long time ago when I was a PhD student. I told my colleague that I, my, yeah, my colleague, that I, I wanted to take this course in your networks. This was 2008 or something like that. You know, he looked at me and, and he said, like, I, that's silly, you know, <laughs> uh, like SVMs is the way to go, <laughs> right? <laughs> SVMs today are, you know, yes, you can use them in SKLearn. They are useful, but it's not exactly what drove this explosion we have now. Right, so okay, I've seen it, uh, but even though I've followed this the last nearly 20 years, right? Uh, it's, I couldn't predict the last year's developments. I couldn't predict the, the image uh, text to image models, uh, how extremely good and impressive they are, or I couldn't like predict the 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 success and, and the, the power of the large language models and the systems based on those like like chat GPT. So I'm a little bit <laughs> careful when it comes to <laughs> saying <laughs> or making forecasts about what is going to be in five years from now, right? Uh, but historically, how we got here, uh, the the ideas, the theories, right? All the fundamental concepts, they've been around for many, many years, right? I mean, the first neural network paper is from 1943, right? And, and back propagation, it was rediscovered many times, but it's from like the 70s, essentially, right? I mean, convolution on a network. I mean, of course, like a big thing now here is the transformer model that has been very underlined, underlined a lot of the successes in, in, in NLP, right? The transformer model or transform architecture. And that is from 2017. But I would say that's nearly the only recent innovation, technical innovation, right? Yeah. All the other stuff is, is like Very 10, old. 20, 30 yeah. years old, you know? Um, so it, it's more like a compound effect, right? So we... It's compounding effect, yeah? And yeah. it's very interesting to see. And then like, <laughs> it's compounding. And then now with the natural language interfaces, like you have in ChatGPT or as you have in MidJourney, right? Then the creativity or like the ideas of how to use them, what you can do with them, has spread to the masses. Before it was only a few trained people that can program, that had an understanding of this, that could do things with it, right? Which meant that the, the, like, the creativity was very constrained or, or not constrained, I mean, they were of course creative people, right? Yeah. But like very few people can do something. Now anyone can. Yeah, It, it changes a lot and you get this explosion. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's true. That's something that we just saw like a, something growing like you know linearly and now we see like exponential growth so yeah you, you're right it's very hard to predict what what we've seen not say in a few years like maybe a few months okay cool yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh uh jonathan can you can you uh can you hear us can we hear you can we hear you <laughs> we don't hear you Say something. Oh. Oh, it's the worst. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's painful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, maybe I want to... So when it comes to the... And this ties in a little bit to, to the goal. Well, not a little bit, a, a lot. To the goal of what Open Fabric wants to do, right? Is Is that by making it accessible to many people, then you can uh, get into this compounding effect. And And I have a very nice example that I read about. Uh, it relates to open source, right? And, and now, of course, open source is not sufficient with, with deep learning today because of the size of the models and the data sets and so, right? But, but so... Uh, you've all heard about Jan LeCun and the convolution on your networks. If you played around with, 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 with deep learning, you have seen MNIST data set, right? This like digits data set. Uh, and, and so, so Jan LeCun is one of the, the grandfathers of, of 
of deep learning, and he won the Turing Prize 2018 together with Hinton and, and Benjo. Uh, and uh, so he made this convolutional network. He didn't invent the convolutional network, but I think he made one of the early versions that was trainable by backpropagation and applied to the recognition of handwritten digits. And it was used by, you can hear us, good. And it was used by the US uh, Postal Service, right? And this was, I think, in the end of the 80s, like 89 or something like that. Uh, he did it working for AT&T or something like that. He worked for, for, for a private company, right? Okay. But says he did it there. So, okay. Well, I should jump a little. I, I should connect <laughs> it. So, in 2012 then, so this is, uh, what is it? Like, like many years later, more than 20 years later, right? Uh, Alex Krzyzewski in, in, in Jeff Hinton's lab, they, they um, made a similar network. I think they made it a little bit deeper. It's a little bit bigger, more parameters, but it's the same architecture. They trained it on ImageNet uh, database, uh, and they had it compete in the ImageNet competition, uh, and, and they won, and they won by a big margin. And this is one of the events that, that kick-started the renewed interest in deep learning and neural networks, right? Uh, but really, the knowledge, that architecture, like all the theoretical foundations, like actually the, the, the actual architecture had existed for more than 20 years. But because it wasn't open source, it wasn't part of any packages, it couldn't really spread. Other researchers could maybe see it, right? But they would have to implement their own. And, you know, with all the time that takes and all the possible bugs and getting the data sets and la, 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 which meant that it spread very, very slowly. Yes, after 20 years, it made it into Jeff Hinton's lab. And, you know, but compare that to now that anyone can use stable diffusion and <laughs> develop the prompts, right? You, you get so much more creativity, so much faster development, right? So the accessibility is super important. Yeah, okay, enough. <laughs> <laughs> so Jonathan, can, can, you, can you hear us? Can we hear you? I can, I can hear you and... Okay. We yes. hear you. Can you hear me now? Finally, yes. yes. Okay, perfect. So I'm and, and glad that I managed to get it fixed uh, by the help of you. Andrew. So I believe the short conversation uh, um, and there are a couple of questions in the comment section. What we have, as I mentioned initially, this entire conversation will center around two segments. So uh, carefully ask questions about open fabric and innovative approach. And the next segment, on the, the audience, people who are listening, to pose their question directly to you. So, that we will jump straight to this uh, question for. Uh, so we have uh, from the session, Andre. So, the first question on my list is uh, Can you explain the concept of open uh, how it is relevant in the context of AI research? Start for me, yeah. All right, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's. the the I would say we start with like the overall goal, right? So <laughs> as, as I talked before about the importance of accessibility to make it like make it possible for anyone to interact and test and develop their ideas, right? And and open source has been, of course, great, and it's absolutely the cornerstone in this, right? But with uh, uh, deep learning and the, 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 this recent trends or the last few years trends in deep learning, well, actually, last not last ten years, I guess, <laughs> right? Where, where it's really bigger and bigger and bigger models that. Uh, gives you gives the, the the great results right or the state of the art results. That means that like open source is not enough. I have a good computer. I got like a let's say, and he sponsored me. and they gave me a great graphic, great computer, great graphics card, and I still cannot really. I cannot. I cannot 
train a lot of these models. I cannot really, I cannot run many of those models, like forget trying to run uh, the biggest language models and so, right? Uh, and, and, and I have an unusually good computer. I mean, so most people do not, right? Which means that even if, if the source code is there in GitHub or GitLab, right? You can still not really use it, right? You might have ideas, but you cannot try them out. You cannot develop them. You cannot build on it, right? And so if this is the overall problem, this is the what, what Open Fabric wants to address. It wants to make this available available to people so that people can well you can also just use it right you don't have to do research with it but if you think about it from the research or, or creativity kind of development aspect right uh, then to make it possible for anyone to experiment and build stuff put things together uh, that is the goal right and then how that will happen is, of course, then the, the follow-up question, right? And the idea is to, well, not the idea, that's like what Andre has built, <laughs> right? It's in test, test net, <laughs> right? But uh, it's to build something like a marketplace or an ecosystem where you can sell, like, so say that I... Uh, uh, train a model, maybe I train another model, I figure out some way of connecting them, and then I can set up that little system or little agent uh, that performs some task, and I can publish it, and then there will be a hardware provider somewhere that can run it, and you as a um, uh, user can then pay to use it, and I and the hardware providers get paid for use, right? But what is more interesting, okay, that's a, that's a cool thing, right? And that, that is the, the kind of, to create like a marketplace for like AI services or so, right? Uh, uh, Andre will later talk about like how <laughs> uh, it is implemented uh, more practically, right? But But what you then can take is that you, can take what I have built and combine it to build yet something else, right? So you can build, like if I publish something, you can build on top of that, right? So the way I think about this is, uh, now it's me coming from neuroscience. Uh, so, so where does research fit into this? First, I don't want to limit me myself and say like, well, research is only for academic researchers, right? Yeah. Because I see that that normal, I mean, like normal people, it sounds <laughs> dumb because actually, because these are not normal people. These are people who think very hard and have great ideas, right? That's that's not what I want to mean with normal people, right? These are unusual people, right? But unusual people, that might not be associated with research labs or companies, research heavy companies, right? It can be in other ways, nor people without the resources, maybe without the, the academic training and all that, right? But unusual people still, right? Yeah. So when I mean, what, what, when I talk about research is really like what all kinds of people can develop and experiment and and produce right so more maybe like creativity and i, I think there open fabric has a, a, a big role to play because it makes the things that takes otherwise very specific resources very specific knowledge available to people with ideas yeah right i i i guess that that you you just pointed something very important you know from the perspective of you know open fabric architecture and how is you know different from other, you know, uh, existing, you know, frameworks and environments, it, is that it, it, you know, the the working assumption and the core idea that we we actually started the project was about to let people to combine multiple models. So, a, as you mentioned, sometimes you just want to make use of other people's work and to build on top of that. And as we see right now, uh, essentially, uh, if you want to do a research, if even if, 
it's not maybe academic as like an industry, you have to build a product or something. You still have to build everything from scratch. It's like, uh, and, and I like this, uh, this metaphor. It's like you want to be a Uber driver and you have to build the roads, you have to build a car, everything by itself. So this is what, what is currently happening. But in the end, you just want to be like Uber driver. You just want to drive your car. So uh, I, I guess this is one of the most challenging and like the, the top and hardest entry point when it's about uh, developing or creating application, working with AI, is that it has a very high entry barrier, which is not only because the math and the, all, all the complex things around, but also because the, you know, the, the infrastructure requirement and how you have to build everything by itself. Uh, so um, yeah, in, in, in this way, Open Fabric, it tried to create a protocol and which is, well, a protocol is something very easy to explain, but very hard, very hard to actually grasp. So internet is a protocol. It's, it's just set a rule. It's, it's just something that everyone, you know, it's uh, following. And this way we can communicate over the internet, right? So similarly, Open Fabric is created like a protocol, which is designed to let people to create a application, which, you know, basically utilizing a models that can basically combine and, and, and communicate together. So, um, yeah, I guess that would be something, you know, different compared with, you know, other projects and how other people are approaching the AI problem, because the way I see it, and I guess you can, you can maybe confirm it, uh, most of the people try to focus on a model and make the best out of it, make, make the, best, the best model, which uh, get, get the best uh, solution, but not how we can combine all these great mm -hmm. solutions mm -hmm. together. So, so, so I think this is the the second part to to answer about research, uh, and now we're talking about what I believe is going to come, right? <laughs> and I said before, like that's impossible to know given how quick the changes are. But okay, what I guess and what I feel I start to see, and also colored by my background in in, in your science, right, is that that that. Since uh, around 2012, the focus in, in AI and deep learning, which has become synonymous with AI, but it sh doesn't have to be, right? But uh, has been the focus on end-to-end -end models, right? That like you, they are, uh, you have an input, you get an output, and in between you have a black box, right? That kind of yeah, an end-to-end -end model, right? And that trained end-to-end. -end. Uh, uh, so in a way, it's a, it's a quite homogeneous model. Right, I mean, architecturally, right? It's, it's uh, like one network that does all the work. Yeah, yeah. may come from neuroscience, like we learn early on, <laughs> and we see it a lot that the brain itself, which is you know the kind of the one intelligent machinery that we actually know of, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The brain itself is not homogeneous; it's, it's heterogeneous, right? We have many different structures in the brain, and these structures not only are they anatomically distinct, right? You can even you see them by the naked eye, actually, if you open the skull, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which you shouldn't do. Uh, well, anyhow, like uh, you see them by the naked eye, you all recognize them, or some of the superficial ones when you see them, right? Uh, uh, but they're also functionally distinct. So we have specialized structures performing specialized tasks. These are integrated in one way or another to produce the overall behavior that a human can perform, right? Uh, and I think that's going to be a similar. So, so you can think about the brain is not a homogeneous end-to-end -end trained network. Yeah? yeah, I expect that to be a similar development in AI as we move towards more like AGI style uh, stuff. And I feel that. Have you seen uh, Auto GPT? <laughs> and I read about uh, uh, another uh, uh, idea called uh, what's it called like a Chat LLM, right? Yeah. Where they are building essentially like Auto GPT is, is maybe not that complicated, but like what they do is that they set up a uh, combine a set of heterogeneous tools. Uh, and it gives it like the overall task and then it can recurrently call ChatGPT and uh, it can use different different tools. So it's it really, it is a heterogeneous system, 
it's a set of modules put together to perform the, the more complex task. And uh, the idea with, with chat LLM is, is similar, right? That you, you do combine different, I like to think about them as modules because that's what they talk about in your science, right? Uh, and, and, and Open Fabric is really uh, at the core built with this type of modularity and way to a possibility to chain or, or connect different subsystems or different models uh, together to perform a more complex task. I think my personal guess is that this is uh, our way forward. And uh, I'm not sure if Andre, <laughs> well, <laughs> we didn't talk about it a couple of years ago when he decided for this architecture, but now I'm very happy that he did. All right, that's me about research. Yeah, so, uh, you know, given we see every day, like all, all this concern regarding ethics of AI, you know, because you, because how we create, you know, AI, which are like properly behaving somehow, you know, so uh, from, from, you know, from your experience and your perspective, what do you think that would be like some, you know, ethical steps or, you know, how we, how we ensure that or how we should, uh, you know, build AI system which are somehow ethical or behave in an ethical way? Because, you know, in, in the end, AI tools are just tools, are just machine, like we're doing things. So um, th this is something is very very hard. So I, I wonder what what is your opinion on on, on that part? You know? Well, it is uh, difficult. <laughs> Again, we don't know, right? We don't know how people are going to use things. We don't know what consequences those actions are going to have, right? I mean, like a lot of the things with the internet that we see today that like has become ethical issues. It wasn't predicted in advance, right? Or maybe somewhere, right? But and another thing is that 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 I should say like the ethics of things is is like is 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 also heterogeneous, right? Like it, there's many different aspects to this. People often think just about okay, how do we stop uh, like a model from from generating fake news or something like that, right? But if you if you start to think like like more about it, you see that the guy actually has so many more aspects to this. Uh, the stochastic the stochastic parrots paper is is a great example <laughs> of this. Um, well, when I have thought deeply about this, and they 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 point out many different aspects. So one thing I think for us to be able to we need to be able to judge if the behavior of something is uh, desirable if it is ethical. And when you have these uh, systems that are completely opaque, they're hidden behind, you don't even know if there is some kind of machine learning AI system at work. Uh, I read about the use of, of AI or machine learning in policing in the United States. Uh, and it's known that they use it. There's some examples of it, but there's no general kind of insight into how much what it does or like it is not 100% opaque but you know 99% opaque right uh, and, and and that is, i think to me that's the first step like it has to be transparent so people can inspect it see what it does and actually form an opinion about it right and open fabric since it is you know open <laughs> right uh, it does provide that possibility. And I think when we talked this before, Andre suggested some kind of, of, of community moderation uh, mechanism, right? But like that hinges on people being able to actually see what does a given service or agent do, right? Anyone should be able to inspect and thus be able to make uh, an informed decision about it right so it's in a kind of the ethics here i think uh, is like it has a very democratic kind of touch right uh, yeah uh, that, that, that that's true so um even from the start we we got this this difficult decision because it was a difficult design you know uh difficult design decision when we architecture open fabric uh you know system 
So it, it's about, okay, you want to be the gatekeeper, then you can simply, you know, uh, filter things, which is something easy to do, but it, it somehow contradicts the overall philosophy of what we're building. So we want to build an open decentralized ecosystem. Uh, so if we, we, we did a lot of research and we find like, you know, the best uh, solution for that will be to use community as a curator. Basically, you let your community to uh, uh, decide and, in, in, if, and, in, in, and if there, there's a lot of people telling that something is bad, that the protocol itself will remove that. You don't have to be like a centralized entity who's deciding about, you know, the quality, about the uh, how something is behaved. Rather, we want to use, you know, the community itself as a way to, you know, in, in a democratic way, I could say. It, yeah, you know, it's to... essentially like the democratic idea, right? Like yeah. You don't have a dictator, benevolent or not, right, <laughs> that decides what is good and what is bad, but, you know, uh, you do it democratically. Yeah, so... Uh, I, I guess th th this is our approach to the problem. I even though, even though somehow, I guess we're far away from actually solving, you know, all this, because it, it kind of opened up a lot of difficulties, you know, when it's about in ethics in AI, because it's a machine. When it's a machine, it doesn't care about. It, it doesn't feel like you're a human. It doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't care about your problems. It, it, it's just doing what it has to do. But in in a way, we already seen that somehow uh even like in maybe you got like automatic ticket for your you know parking in the right wrong, wrong place or like a camera that is you no know, recording you doing something bad and get an automatic ticket for that uh but you know i i think that you know by letting people actually to be involved in the process to be like human in the loop we will be able to provide this you know human touch on, on, on all these different different problems different aspects and I think also it allows for the flexibility. Like if you set up very strict rules about how to handle it in advance, since you really cannot predict exactly how it's going to be used, those rules might quickly become obsolete or, or turn out to be actually counterproductive, right? But in this way, to, to enable basic democracy to act as the, the ethical filter or like to enforce ethic, ethics it seems like it should be flexible enough to to actually deal with like the unforeseeable future but it's a very difficult issue actually yeah yeah and as the power of the systems become more powerful the, <laughs> the question becomes more difficult <laughs> it's interesting though it's a very good question to to discuss yeah, so I, I guess it, it's about more about who's who's checking the the guy checking things. So th yeah. that's more like the problem. So who who watches the watchman? Yeah, who's watching the watchman? That 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 was it. So that's why we think like a, a big group of people, like the community itself, uh, it has like this mass. How it's called, like the mass uh, uh, wise. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the wisdom of crowds. Yeah, wisdom of the crowds. Francis Galton, 1853 or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's absolutely true. Yeah, cool. So I, I guess we can t take some some question that we got from the community in the live channel. So I guess the first question it's about how how do you you know how how do we ensure security. So I, I guess th this is more like about ensuring security, like from the end user perspective, like, you know, user data. So um, I, I guess the, the, the right answer to, to that is uh, to, to give like a, a bit overview about, you know, maybe the, what are the current, you know, uh, way of ensuring like user privacy, maybe in some current model, then we can add like, you know, how we're doing open fabric. So. Uh, I think you better start, Andre. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, um, in in you know in the way we see, we got a lot of people complaining, especially about ChatGPT, about being afraid to be you know steal their data, steal their ideas, steal their everything. Uh, and of course, I guess that information get 
get get get into th those those algorithms and you know get processed and maybe it improves some some models or not. Uh, but I guess what is important that people somehow afraid that their idea or the things they're doing can somehow stolen. Yeah, well, well, actually, like I think many companies they prohibit the use of ChatGPT because. I think legally you agree to open AI using the data that you submit. So if you now take uh, like uh, some internal documentation and say like, and, and want to use that for some question answering using ChatGPT, then you give open AI your internal documentation. Right, so that's a real, that's a real problem that I, I see that, that I, I think Amazon, for example, they, they made it, uh, a ban on using ChatGPT at work. Okay, continue. Sorry. If, if, even countries, we, we we saw like Italy banning ChatGPT. So oh, I, I, I guess they, they turned <laughs> I don't know it why back, but they, they turned it back. But they were like banned for uh, even even how. So um, our, our you know we 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 thought about this problem from the start because the, of course this is a real issue and people people. Uh, are concerned about that. So our approach to that was you know, to create something we call trusted execution environment. So essentially like a sandbox that is accessible only to the, to the you know, basically the people using that, that algorithm, using that uh, uh, instance. So no one you know, outside of that can see the input which, which gets in, into, the, into, into the sandbox. So this is a, it's a good way to, to make sure that people are, are comfortable using a application on the top of Open Fabric. Uh, it, it, even more important, it's because it's running in a decentralized way. So it can run multiple infrastructure provider hardware. Uh, so utilizing the, um, utilizing the um, uh, trusted execution environment, solve that, that, that part of the problem regarding the security of the data and ensuring that end user um, information is, is secured. Can you hear me? I hear you. Okay, cool. It, it showed me that there's like some connection problem. Uh -huh. uh, okay, so uh, I, I guess the, the second question um, would be like, you know, to, you know, th there's some, somebody asking about what, what is like the, the biggest difference, you know, between open fabric and other layer ones, you know, other layer ones. Uh, so I guess when, when they, they call layer one, they, they essentially uh, tell about other blockchain system. So uh, I, I guess I can, can, can start that just to say that, you know, other layer one are focusing more on just doing transaction, moving assets and things like that. But in difference, Open Fabric is utilizing all this, you know, amazing tool, which is the blockchain itself and utilizing to scale up and deploy and, and you know, make AI, you know, make, AI technology vastly accessible. So um, uh, I uh, I could I could I could say that you know in a way uh, Open Fabric is is building on top of you know uh, blockchain technology, but it is building a, a completely new type of uh, environment or a completely new type of ecosystem. So in a way, it's similar how, you know, Ethereum, you know, did with their smart contract. Essentially, they, they got the idea from the, from the Bitcoin, but they're building something even more powerful and something that we basically create the revolution of, you know, uh, Web3 and, 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 and blockchain. Um, so let's see what... Uh, uh, Does that answer the question? Alex, it's Alex who asked this, right? Does it answer your question? 
they sit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess they just just can write. They they can they can they cannot talk. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I hope this provides some you know a good a good answer to the question. Uh, the the third one. Uh, so we, which one which one of the other layer ones you think would be the most compatible with Open Fabric AI, and how probable is to create bridge with them? So I guess the short, the short answer to that is that we, we try to build an open ecosystem. And that means we want to create bridges with you know, uh, all the people willing to make use of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So essentially right now, the easiest, the easiest integration can be done with all the EVM compliant chain. So essentially, if you like an other EVM compliant uh, blockchain, it's very hard to, to deploy a bridge. We even have prepared something we call an integration wizard that essentially is like a next, 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 next uh, application, which is doing all the steps and taking care of all, all, all the integration, all the bridge smart contracts that are required uh, to be deployed. So um, in a nutshell, we try to be open and to integrate with all the people which are interested in utilizing and building you know uh, artificial intelligence in in their product or in the in the things they're doing so um, the fourth question let's see uh, what can you guys tell us about the feature that we'll be able to test so um, in, in the upcoming uh, testnet, uh, you will be basically able to uh, deploy an AI application, create an instance out of it, use it, run it, and um, you know, uh, essentially get the entire user flow. We already have prepared the entire user flow for, you know, for deploying an AI application as a developer but also using it as from, from the end user perspective. I just show, I guess, a few days ago, a demo to Helmar about the deep fake. <laughs> <laughs> it's running it in real time. Well, maybe offset by like 50 milliseconds or so, right? But yes. Yeah. So I guess one of the, the biggest challenge we try to overcome is that we want to create an application we provide like, let, let's say close to real time feedback. Because um, I guess Helmar can, can give you a bit insight of how, how much resource an AI application requires to run. And most of the time, these GPUs are kind of uh, uh, expensive. And uh, yeah, you, you, you still have to do a lot of optimization to make sure that a lot of people can make use of you know, some shared resource, which currently are, are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty expensive and pretty scarce. Um, the fifth question, what does open fabric lack right now? So I, um, well, <laughs> that's, that's, that's an interesting question. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's very, very easy to find a lot of things that you need. Uh, but I couldn't say that it's lacking rather it's, it's more about, you know, um, um, how could I say more, more exposure? Maybe more people have to know about it. More people have to, you know, understand to take some time to to look over maybe the white paper about all the technical details. Because once the people understand it and see what we're building, they, they start to see, you know, the, the 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 real vision and where we try to to aim at. Because you know, there, there's a lot of you know, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about you know. Uh, the blockchain, the AI, people kind of, you know, mix things and, you know, uh, didn't go to the proper time to, to reflect about the, the, the vision itself, you know, and which, what we try to, to build. So I guess something that it will be, you know, useful to us, it will be like people to uh, speak about us, to, to take some time to understand, and of course, to, to become a sort of, you know, uh, uh, promoter of our, our project and, and, uh, and our vision, because the vision is more important than the, you know, than the, the technical side, what we try to achieve. And I guess this is, it, it's, it's, you know, it's very important on, on, the, on the long run. 
uh, as there's another question. Um, when you're going to start the beta, uh, are you going to be able to test some of the feature or it will be a closed one? Uh, so essentially we're going to create like an, an open version of the, our, our beta platform. Uh, of course, we're going to let people, you know, join in and make use, as I mentioned, running those AI application uh, are very high consuming, requiring a lot of resources. Uh, we will gradually activate and let more and more people to use it. So as you saw, like in ChatGPT, those warning, hey, right now it's, it's extremely used. You, you have to wait a bit for make use of it. So uh, you, you, may, you maybe see something like that in our case too. Uh, but the, the more we, we, we manage to deploy more infrastructure and to, and to enlarge our, our execution network, then it will get more smoothly and people will be able to make use out of that. So um, I guess it, it, it's a natural way to, to roll out such complex and such, such a, 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 you know, a resource intensive uh, a protocol. Um, okay, the next question would be like, uh, what, what utility your native, native token will have? So, um, Regarding the token itself, so the the native token it's it's something it's it's very important because with, without it you cannot you cannot build a decentralized network it's, it's it's almost impossible. So the the token itself will, will will be used as a as a main mean for the people to do you know exchange value basically. So doing payments you know uh, create healthy reward system because you know as as initially we thought about you know that you know community curator and, and all these things the protocol itself we, we have to provide some way to to create the right incentives like in game theory you know in game theory we have to create like a set of rules that will incentivize good behavior and will penalize the bad one so well this is something not not specific to us rather something specific to blockchain itself and to into decentralized systems so uh, having the native token, it, it's very important in order to create this ecosystem with all these player, which you know are different. We have like infrastructure provider, we have developers, data provider. So with the token and with all this rule uh, encoded at the protocol level, we can somehow ensure that everyone behave in a proper way, in a way that let the ecosystem grow, in a way that. Uh, it, it, may, it, it makes sense to, to have a good contribution and be rewarded for that. Okay. So can you tell us your priority on short time and also on medium timestamp? Uh, so yeah, <laughs> that, 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 that's quite hard. That's quite hard to, to, to answer because when you're dealing with a startup, uh, you know, everything seems to be uh, important and uh, you, you have to, fo you want to focus on a lot of things. Uh, but of course, um, in short term, we, you know, we want to make the, of course, our protocol life and make it accessible to people to use it. We want people actually to use what we're building. Uh, of course, on the long run, we also, we continue doing our normal work, doing research and I guess, Right now, we, we work with Calamar on a new research paper uh, because, you know, uh, working in, you know, in the, on, the, you know, on, on the research part, you, you, you have to do the research all the time. It's not like you've you done it once, you write a white paper and you forgot about it. So uh, it, it's, it's more like an ongoing work. So there's a lot of research, a lot of things that we, we, we learn every day because more and more things are popping up as Calmar told it's very hard to predict where the AI will be in, in maybe in not years, but even, even in months. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. I guess, uh, let me see. Yeah, th there's another question. What is the, what is the, no, that was similar to the last one. Um, 
what's the biggest collaboration you already did or you would want to do in the future. So um, when it's about collaborating, it's, it's about, we think about, you know, about, you know, uh, engaging with smart people, discussing with part, smart people, working with smart people, because sometime when, you know, a group of smart people get together and they build something interesting together, uh, so, some amazing out, outcome can, can get from that. So we have many partnerships with other people like, you know, ZK Sync and, 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 you know, and API Tree and other cool people around. But I guess what we are very interested on in is to onboard like you, uh, um, onboard like new, 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 new people which are willing to uh, work and willing to uh, make use of AI technology uh, in, in, in their core products, in their protocol, in their whatever they're doing. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's another interesting one. So what is the plan for attracting new developers uh, to open fabric and what benefit will people who build AI application open fabric hair uh, have compared to building on other blockchains? Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting question and it's, it's quite a good one. Uh, so essentially, um, if you're talking with, uh, you know, uh, AI developers, you will see that all of them has a common problem. They don't have a way to actually, you know, as we, as we start our discussion, they, they don't have a, a way to actually build those models. They don't have a way to uh, experiment because they, they are very expensive. And as, as, as in my comparison with the Uber driver, you have to build everything by yourself. You have to, um, you have to do like the infrastructure, you have to do the configuration, everything by yourself, instead of just focusing on the thing that you're really good at. So if you're like a very good AI developer, know how to create models, you can simply focus on that and forget about the, all, the, all the things which you, know, you, you normally now have to, have to take care of. So um, yeah, I guess yeah. for... I've, I, sorry. Yeah, please, please. Other blockchains don't like... Other blockchains essentially only uh, support the transfer of value, right? You will have yeah. to, uh, how do you get the compute? How do you plug in the compute? How do you publish model? All that kind of stuff you have to make yourself, right? Open Fabric is, is built to with an infrastructure to provide that service so that you only need to focus on the model itself and you publish it and open fabric takes care of the rest sorry yeah so it, it, it yeah it, it, it's quite it's quite it's quite a good answer so in, in in a way you know the other layer one as you mentioned are focusing on you know moving values rather we we, we call it okay we are focusing on moving like intelligent services rather you know it's it's more like i'm using an intelligent service like an ai application and I'm utilizing that it is not only about, you know, moving like some value from an account to another one. If, even though at the fundamental level, you, we make use of that in, in all these, you know, transactions beside all these, you know, players from the, you know, using the protocol itself. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, how does your layer one platform leverage AI to improve the scalability and efficiency of blockchain transaction. <laughs> yeah, we should, we should write an app that can uh, uh, rewrite the source code uh, of the uh, itself or <laughs> yeah. self-improving. That is, as Andre, you might correct me. Like, you correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, that is not implemented yet. It would be super cool with a self-improving system here, like you have an... Uh, uh, AI agent that like uh, figures right, out it's code. right, right. It's code well, and the whole open fabric code, right? And then it just like spins off into space, like singularity, <laughs> all that, right there. But yeah, now that that's 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 to come. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, what was the next one? What is the low hanging fruits for open fabric AI? 
So that's that that's a tricky question because you, you can think of a lot a lot of things, right? So I guess you know most of the most of the easy a easy way of you know utilizing it, most of the uh, simple way to to uh, get advantage out of open fabric is that you basically can use of some complex model easily. So you you as an end user, you don't have to be technical. You know, as as like you know, you're using like a diffusion mode. You don't have to know what is a diffusion mode. You don't care about it. You just in input, you put your text, hit the button, and and get back the 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 result. So uh, in a way, it lets people to use all these fancy things which they see normally like videos on on the social media channel. They can use it themselves for for real. So that that will be something. I I think another thing is if you are uh, interest in developing something, uh, what we have seen lately uh, with this uh, image, natural language to image or text to image, and, and also with, with uh, the language models, uh, is that you see that, that there are startups or apps that are essentially just prompt engineering. So, like you upload a picture and then they add a picture to that. Now add a prompt to that picture and send it to Stable Diffusion, for example, and then the user gets back, uh, you know, a, a nice picture, right? Or you upload your your what LinkedIn profile and the app adds some prompt that they figured out is good, and you get back a nice resume, nicely formatted maybe LaTeX format mm -hmm. the resume, right? Okay, but so where there is, this is like kind of, you can think about this as two modules here that are connected, right? The, the, the prompt added by the app, and then of course in the background you have have a, a big model, right? Like Stable Diffusion or, or ChatGPT or something like that, right? But but this is a very, you know, it's a, it's a thin layer, like the prompt engineering part, but that type of thing, I think, is a good, that's low hanging fruit, right? Like this should be very easy to do for someone that's interested in developing something to play around with and do these kind of things on open fabric, right? You don't need to, yeah, that you, you can really just do it in an afternoon, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's see. There's, I guess, the, the room for a last question. Uh, so, will the token launch create a DAO community, or are those only for perks while using AI tools? So, um, you know, as you know, um, as I, as I mentioned, maybe in in other, in other discussions. So, the idea is that we're creating a truly decentralized ecosystem. Of course, on the long run, we want to have like. A, uh, autonomous organization, you know, and, and the, the system itself to work by itself. So it, we don't want to see, you know, uh, people gatekeeping it or, you know, people uh, control it. So, of course, it makes a lot of sense to be like a sort of a, a global distributed, you know, network of people who are contributing on, on governing the protocol itself. So it's, it's like the internet. Uh, Right now, there isn't like a, you know, it's not like Google or other company controlling the internet. So it's something that is something emergent. Of course, there are companies controlling like nodes and you know all the infrastructure and putting all this together. But in essence, there's no such like a single company or like a, you know single entity that can switch on or off the internet. Of course, they can do it in countries. Uh, like in some not, not so cool countries, uh, but at the global level, uh, this is something that works somehow in, in, in a decentralized way. Of course, it's not that decentralized that we, we see it, for instance, in, in, in blockchain, but still is, is, uh, is the result of, you know, uh, it's like an emergent result from many people working together. So this is something that we see uh, also for on the long run for open fabric. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we we got some more questions, but you know, I guess we we, we don't have uh, any more time for for today's discussion. Uh, we we we, uh, we we thank you very much for all, all of you, you know, taking part on the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hjalmar, for for being part of you know this amazing discussion. 
Thanks uh, for being invited. Yes, yeah, so hopefully we will going to have maybe another one in the future. Uh, yeah, so thank you, thank you very much uh, for for uh, for being today here. Uh, yes, yeah, so see you around. Have a good have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye bye.